Sorry, I just, my mind just went that way. All right, so we just want to start off real quick. Do we have any visitors today? Name and call sign and where are you from? All right, K5WMY from Midwest City, welcome. Anybody else? All right, so now we'll start off with our uh, normal introductions. We're gonna start over here at the Klein Master. I would be Mark in 5HZR, Norman, America. Larry? Larry, <laughs> Larry had something in his mouth, sorry. <laughs> Lost the audio. All right, and then I'm going to go to, oh, I can't stand there. The people who are streaming on YouTube, I'm going to call out and recognize you. We've got uh, Carl, KG5 SSW, just wave at the camera, sir. All right, Mike, HXT. Then we got Glenn, WRQ. And we got Peter Laws, who was sleeping a while ago whenever I was hollering at him. But Peter, are you there? I am, I am the center square. You're still asleep or you've got something going on with your microphone. So KJ7 EFF. And we got AE5L. Al, did I miss Morning anybody here, online? And we welcome those of you that's uh, watching by YouTube also. Modern technology is great. All right, so what we're going to do is we've got a special guest here that's gonna put on an educational portion for us. And I am going to turn this over to Mark, who's gonna say three, a couple four. of words for our guest. Pretty good, I'm doing the slow, soft shuffle to let them get the mic set up. Um, our guest today is Bill Walker, W5GFE, Gulf Fox Echo. And uh, he's from the Ada area, has been a computer science prof, uh, retired from down in that area. Uh, he runs a... No, we can't hear them. Yeah, the co-host screwed up and muted the speaker because he's asleep. It, no, he accused you of being asleep. Completely my fault. Sorry, guys. I, uh, when I was a kid, I was, was I lived in Canyon, Texas, and uh, Amarillo is about 20 miles north. And I had a buddy up there, and uh, we were like 14 years old. And I was wanting to, to talk to my buddy on two meter teletype. And that was the when the big old Model 33s were there and that kind of thing. It, it, it was definitely an undertaking, 
but uh, I put an antenna up on a, a piece of irrigation pipe and uh, called up my tower and hung it up there. Couldn't talk to Amarillo, just couldn't do it. So I uh, crawled back up the tower and started down the tower carrying that antenna. And I got a little below, you know, 10, 12 feet below the top of the uh, tower and walkie talkie on my belt squawked. And I thought, well, that's not right, but I strapped the antenna back to the side of the tower and went downstairs and I could work my buddy on teletype and tried to figure out what in that. I mean, you lower an antenna and you get more performant than I, you know, something wrong here. So got to looking and there's one hill between Amarillo and Canyon, one hill, it's called Canyon Hill, if you've ever been out that way. And that was the answer. I was getting signal diffraction over the edge of that, that the, the edge of the escarpment there on the Llano Estacado. And that let me work my buddy with, with what with them were really weak signals, but of course today you probably do it with your handy talk. Well, that was my first introduction to signal propagation at VHF. And since then, there's been a lot of water uh, passed through all of that. Uh, let's see, my uh, uh, need to do the commercial right quick. I'm retired professor of computer science from East Central and Ada, where uh, I was chair of the computer science department for a long time. I was first licensed in 1961. I've had all sorts of publications in the radio business since then. My real interest with the current project, at least, is how far can you see with an antenna? And is there a way to find out before you have to build a thing? And so I've looked at all sorts of different software, given my professional training, and uh, and. Yeah, you, you can model antennas. Now, modeling is just modeling. All it does is kind of give you an idea of what's going on. People that, that take modeling as the last end all, do all, the, the catch me on, all that, uh, they're, they're wrong. They, they, it's an approximation of reality. And that's what this thing I'm showing you today is too. But yeah, you, you can, can model uh, software systems. The, especially at the frequencies that used to be considered lying aside, like <laughs> six and two meters and things like that, and in 420 and, and 440 and so on. Signals above 20 megahertz are, are generally affected by terrain, especially the higher you get. When you get up in the microwave regions, you, you, as you know, you get a, a the propagation effects uh, change drastically, but we can still model. You get shadowing by, by terrain features. You get a, a, a big hill and you stand behind it. You can't hear the guy on the other side. And you get diffraction, which is sort of, uh, I first learned about diffraction by, by digging out an optics book when I was 14 years old, trying to figure out why I could or could talk to my buddy in Amarillo. Signal the, Signal attenuation just by distance is, is easy. That's a, a, a mean square kind of a thing. That, that's, but other effects like edge diffraction and, and uh, so on and so forth are a whole lot different. Some models can uh, accommodate some things and some can uh, accommodate others. One of the standard models is a thing called the Longley-Rice model. The Longley Rice model has been used by the Air Force and by the FCC, and it's sort of the de facto standard. And uh, some old boy in uh, New Jersey took the Longley Rice model and released it as an open source piece of software. So you can find this thing on the internet. It's evolved over the years with, with the passing of, 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 of from single processor machines like, like Apple, we're talking things that would run on, on an old Apple II, you know, in a week or 10 days, two weeks maybe, uh, get, get some kind of result, and it wouldn't be a very good one, to our, our modern processors with the multi-cores and so on and so forth. So the software has evolved too. 
but it's been used a lot over the years to do all sorts of things. And one of the big advantages to it, it's accepted uh, in de facto law in the sense that FCC relies on it, the Air Force relies on it. Uh, if you've got an interference problem with, with a military installation and a ham installation, you can model it with this model, and this is the model they would use to try to determine who is a fault in an interference situation and so on and so forth, and, and how to mitigate it. But, so it's important stuff and it's fairly standard. Now, what is diffraction anyhow? Well, here's a, and, and maybe you can rely on optics, but here's a, a, a signal coming and hitting the barrier. Okay, well, it's obscure, it's stuck. Can't, can't go beyond that barrier. <clears throat> if, the, <clears throat> excuse me, if the signal clears the top of the barrier, you can hear the signal, right? Yeah, that's sensible. But if the signal just hits the top of the barrier, there's all sorts of physics going on at that edge. But the bottom line to it is, the signal in effect bends, actually it's re-radiated in a quantum way, but it bends over the top of the, of the, uh, uh, of the obstruction. And it's predictable. The, the equations have been floating around in, in optics books for 150 years. So you can find out this stuff and you can model it with fairly, ah, it's a differential equation and something like that, but there's not, not a terribly big deal to, to model a thing. Yeah. Another effect at the edge of an obstruction is that you kind of get a re-radiation kind of a thing. You don't just get a single signal anymore after it passes over some kind of, think of it as a knife edge. It, it bends, but you also get other lesser effects going off in other directions. Those two are predictable. And if you want to look it up, uh, you can find it in, in optics books, especially under a topic called Fresnel zoned, F-R-E-S-N-E-L, Fresnel. It, 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 it's not pronounced the way we'd spell it, but uh, a Fresnel zone. And people like, uh, oh, uh, internet service providers that provide um, wireless internet like to toss this term around without having the slightest clue what it is. But the, the people they're talking to don't have a clue either. And so it sounds like they know what they're talking about and they don't. Yeah. <laughs> a, uh, a Fresnel zone, it, suppose you had a, a parabolic antenna at each end of a circuit. Well, you get this diffraction over the edge of each of the parabolas. And the, the signal from those diffraction, uh, from those edges of connect up in kind of a football shaped thing. And the bottom line is if you've got a piece of terrain sticking up in that football, you may have some propagation effects around that piece of terrain. If you're football clears all the mountains that are sticking up around. You've got a line of sight, armchair of coffee, nothing, nothing, nothing's gonna interfere with that. So just line of sight alone probably isn't good enough. But having a clearance of Fresnel zones uh, is a slam dunk. I mean, you're talking micro watts at each end and, and armchair of coffee and, and up in the gigahertz range and so on. So you're, you're good. In, Point of practical fact, that doesn't really happen too often. At, at, uh, at microwaves, the Fresnel zone, the football is, is a couple of meters across. At, at, uh, at, at 20 meters, the thing's hundreds of yards across. So, so it, it depends a great deal on frequency. Well, and then the, just plain old distance can affect the signal too. Uh, this is looking down on top of an antenna. More, more like I've, I've skewed it a little bit, just so you can see the pattern 
uh, it, it, the, the signal's strongest at the antenna and it fades out as you get away from it a little bit. And that's fine. Um, tilt it on the edge a little and stick a mountain up in it. Okay. So this mountain close to the antenna shields the terrain behind it. Keeps signal from passing through there. But a simple model like that doesn't account for diffraction at the top of the mountain. And diffraction at the top of the mountain gives certainly the line of sight, but it also gives some bending. Now you've heard that. I mean, you drive down the road that uh, listen to your two meters and, and, and you hear a repeater and it's out there away. And you've all heard picket fencing. You know, that, that, that's diffraction. That, that's what it is, it, it, it just rattles a bit. And, and uh, you, you know yourself that that doesn't last over a big geographical stretch. It's fairly small, but you drive on through it and you're, you're, you're good to go again, or you're not. But edge diffraction can contribute some signal. That is, here's a piece that ordinarily would be shielded by the mountain but if you set up in here, you might be able to hear the, the repeater anyway, because you get the front, you get signal off the edge of that piece of terrain. Okay, now you you, you got to look at, at some more stuff. So what is this thing anyhow? It's modeled after a thing called SPLAT, which is an acronym for something or another. It was <laughs> created the created by, uh, in, in open source by a guy in New Jersey at a community college. He's still active, by the way, KD2BD, uh, to, to, to code up the Longley Rice model. And one of the things that makes it work, and, and this is why most people can't run it at home, is that the, the space shuttle missions, one of their, their jobs was getting a good map of the earth with with all the bumps and all all the mountains and all the hills and all the valleys and all that and that terrain data that's called is monstrous i mean it's it's eight ten gigabytes just it, just just huge it, like length of a full-length movie uh just as, as, as data is as, as, uh, height data that stuff's available online, but the storage requirement is monstrous. And frankly, the bandwidth requirement is monstrous if you try to download this thing. Well, while I was teaching the university, I didn't care about their bandwidth, I downloaded it, you know? So, so uh, I was able to, to, at one time or another, download all that space shuttle data and include it in the Longley Rice model. Well, that, was, that was helpful and it's open source, that original splat has been replaced with a thing called signal server, which now takes advantage of, of uh, modern microprocessors with multi-cores and things like that. The models have been used for all sorts of things. Uh, Pre-construction of, of commercial antennas. Uh, the Channel 9 model its antenna a long time before it put it up. Some of the other stations have done the same thing. And now, in fact, I think they may even be required by the FCC to provide these models before an antenna installation is approved. One of the unique applications of this was with the lunar rover. You know, this, this cart that runs around up on the moon. Uh, the terrain data for the moon was available to NASA. They wanted to know what they could do with that, that cart running around up there and let it talk to the Earth. So they use this, this same sort of thing to, to model that, the, uh, the very same thing, in fact. One of the problems that showed up a, a few years ago was an interference problem between uh, weather radars, government weather radars, and uh, 4, 440 operations on the East Coast. And so they were able to do some modeling and, and you know there are power restrictions on 440. Uh, the, those power restrictions 
are geographical in nature. If, if you live in a certain spot, you can run so much power. If you live in other spots, you can't use 440. If you live in other places, it's more or less wide open. And that's where that kind of, of interference abatement came from, was from this model. Well, it's hard to use. Needed a big old machine to do it. Needed a lot of competing, lots of this, lots of so on and so forth. And my contribution to this is, has been to surround the basic engine, which, which is written C, by the way. If, if, you, if you want to compile it yourself, you can. Uh, I surrounded that basic engine with a website that lets you kind of fill in some blanks and pick your parameters and shoot a picture of this thing and see what it looks like. It provided a... a it was fairly successful in that it's, it, this thing worked to uh, work all continents the first 12 hours on the air. Uh, what this web interface does is provide Longley Rice models and as, as a secondary spinoff line of sight plots. It can give you individual station coverages, it can give you profiles between two stations. In point of fact, they need to be uh, uh, VHF stations. You, I mean, paths between 20 meter stations, you know, there's a whole different ball game going on there. Propagation, atmospherics, and so on and so forth. This does not deal with atmospherics at all. It's strictly a terrain thing. One of the recent things we've done is, is provide output in the form of KMZ files, they're called, which you can load into Google Earth, and then you can look around and see See, you can see which trees are causing the problem. And that's a really neat kind of an arrangement. So how do you use it? Well, you, you go to uh, my website, signalserver.okiefrog.org. You have to, have to register there. When you do that, I, I log your IP number and uh, your, your geographical coordinates. And that's all the log does, but you'd be surprised how helpful that is to toss the Chinese off my website when they start trying to, to uh, uh, give me a problem with it, which they've done recently. Uh, then you can load the, uh, load the KMZ files into Google Earth and you can get a look at all sorts of things. Well, okay, here's the website. Here's what it looks like when you first uh, get on the website. What you need to do is follow uh, Follow this link right here. There are all sorts of things on the website. It says here's what you can do, here's how you, you do it, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, uh, this website can provide several different kinds of plots. This is a Longley Rice plot right here, centered on, I don't know where that is, but uh, this is a line of sight plot for the same piece of geography. Here's a profile plot between two stations. There's a station here with a certain height of antenna, station over here, and you see this bar between them, that's line of sight. This thing sticking up right here is the terrain that would interfere. So you see a, a, essentially, a, here's curvature of the earth, but this might be a mountain or something else sticking up between two stations. So you can see this signal path is probably hopeless at UHF and not, not going to work. But you can lay it and you probably barely see it where you're sitting. I'll get better slides in a minute. Here's one station on Google Earth. Here's the other one. And you barely see it, but there's a line right there between them so that you can follow that line and you can see where on the Earth uh, things stick up too high. Now, how you use that, I don't know. I mean, you can't go and knock a mountain down or something. But I've had some suggestions on, on what you might do to mitigate uh, problems where you've got two stations need to talk and can't. When you register, I try to get a call sign. I try to get uh, latitude and longitude. Idiosyncrasy of that is, is uh, that you have to pay careful attention to the, the sign, especially of longitude. We do it backwards here. 
then the, it, the next screen shows you uh, the information that's in the database, which you can change on the screen if you want, by the way. Then uh, if I'm looking at profiles, you get different screens. Here's a, a, uh, a profile between two stations. That's, um, hmm. I, don't, I don't know what two stations those are. Oh yeah, KM5CL. KA5CXT. And y'all may, y'all probably know those two individuals. One of them is a, is a repeater, I think. I don't know. And here's that profile. Here it is on Google Earth, KA5CXT. And here's the KM5CL. And here's the path between them. Goes right over Kanawha. Uh, it goes between Ada and Gar Corner, and you can see the geography of the land. Here's the, the uh, Canadian River as it loops through there, and if uh, that, that's a, a pretty good path. Here is W5SXA as a repeater, I think, uh, with a, a profile, uh, with a Longley Rice profile done here. You can see where there's, there's color is probably a decent, it's assuming you're talking to a, an antenna on a car that's maybe five feet off the ground or six, something like that. So it, it, it makes assumptions about signal levels and you can enter ERP in it and all sorts of things. I mean, you, you, if you're driving around with a kilowatt in a trunk, you can, you can uh, or, or a big slot antenna on top, you can model that too. But uh, the, the website gives you sort of a, a standard bullseye here. You can see that, that that repeater can reasonably Manette, Kanawha, Sasakwa, but that repeater could not reasonably expect to make an ADA, which is right down here somewhere. Uh, you can see more or less what's good. Now, it is not perfect, it's a model, okay? So, so you can see some guy here who, uh, who lives down the hole in the ground, he can't make it, but if he's up on the side of the hill, maybe even a little further away, he can. It just depends on the terrain. I'm gonna dig down on this one just a little bit. This is a profile between two stations here's KM5CL on the left, W5SXA on the right. And you can see, let's see, here's curvature of the earth. This is the Fresnel zone. Uh, so things sticking up in the Fresnel zone may cause you a little bit of trouble. And here's, here's a piece of terrain that actually interferes with the line of sight. And you gotta wonder how significant that is. So you drill down on it a little bit you, you load it into Google Earth, KM5CL, W5SXA, and here's the pathway between the two, and you, you can drill down a little more. And right here, if you just zoom on, on the web, right there's that hole where the train's sticking up. And I gave this talk to Shawnee Radio Club the other day, and somebody knew, yeah, that's right out in my field, and I know right where that is. You might be able to do something about that. Okay. Like put a repeater right there. Or uh, one suggestion I've made to the state of Texas. Uh, the state of Texas has the, these repeater wagons, I call them, where when there's a, oh, a range fire, or a tornado or something like that. Uh, they've got maybe 20 of these wagons they deploy out in, in the bush somewhere. And they've all got repeaters on them to help the Department of Public Safety uh, talk back to Austin and so on and so forth. Well, they got to put them somewhere. And generally they put them at roadside stops where, hey, there's a bathroom, there's water, there, 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 there's uh, uh, usually there's electricity and things like that. But some of these roadside stops are good to talk to the next roadside stop and some aren't. 
just depends on the repeat. So one of the proposals I made to the state of Texas is to let me model all the roadside stops and see which ones can talk to which and, and pre-compute these deployments so that they don't waste two of their, their eight machines they put out there or whatever they do on the fire. Drill down a little further. I'd forgotten I had this slide. You can see uh, here, here's a pond somewhere and there's the top of the hill where the signal actually stops. You probably get enough diffraction over that edge to be okay. Uh, let's see, this is uh, looking at that path again. Maybe it's, maybe it's a slight, oh, I did this because I wanted to see just how, uh, how accurate this stuff really was. I was relying on coordinates provided to me by the KG5 BGO folks. Well, there's the tower. And you can look at it and the, the transmitting equipment is located in the shack at the base of that tower. You can see the shadow of the tower going out this way. And there's, there's where the model put the, uh, put the signal. It's not bad. People that interpret that, it, is being precise or, or probably wrong. I mean, there's round off error, there, there's modeling error, there are all kinds of things. And it's a statistical approximation, if you want the truth. Here it is at the other end, a kid at KM5 CML, he works in this building, his office is in this corner and he used the coordinates of this corner for the, for the model when he should have been using the coordinates of that antenna on that end of the building for the model. And so I gave him a hard time about it. But the fact is it didn't make a big difference. He knows it and I know it. Here's N5HZR, a Longley Rice plot somewhere. N5HZR, right over there in the corner. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I do with that database where you register your, your call signs and your location is, is allow it to be presented on, on plots like this for future reference. So N5HZR did the plot, but he can see up here to uh, W5PAA and WX5WX, K5THS, down to Byers, he gets some coverage and, and so on and so forth. He can see all the hams that, are, that have used this, this model are located in who he might be able to talk to and who he might not. And I, I run that worldwide. That's not who I want to talk to, right? Well, no, uh, no, no, not, not, not at all. Here's a, here's a pathway from my place to his place, and it's pretty hopeless to tell the truth. I've got a, a, uh, uh, an interruption in it. It's right here on the edge. I'm out east of Ada. There, there's a place right here where somebody cut a road and uh, for, for the the road just quits. Uh, here, you can put multiple plots on the same, same screen if you want to. So here's a pathway from N5HZR to KG5BGO and K5THS. And you can see those plots uh, on the same screen and make all sorts of decisions about them if you want to. There's that pathway from my place to, to his. And you can see that one's pretty hopeless. That doesn't really, yeah, that, that, that's not worth trying to get up on the, the tower for. Here, as I can see from his place heading towards mine, there, there was some kind of a hill out here uh, after which things gave it up. Okay, that, uh, what do you need if you want to roll your own with this stuff? Well, I, I, I've got it running on, uh, uh, on, on Linux. This laptop runs it. It's plenty big enough. Uh, with Apache or in, Nginx, is that what you call it? That, I think this is Nginx I'm running here. You need GNU plot, you need image magic, you need MySQL for the database. You need the Perl language because all this stuff's written uh, uh, to interface the web with it is written in Perl. And then you need that, uh, terrain data from the space shuttle missions. And you need, a, there's a bunch of it. And you need a, a, a willingness to work with the command line, or you just put a web server on your machine 
and uh, install the web software. One of the things I keep telling people is you want to use Google Pro with this. You want to download those KMZ files and by hook or crook, either by loading them to the web or on their own local copy of, of Google Earth or whatever, you want to make use of Google Earth because it's the thing that gives you the visual detail, not the mathematical detail, but the visual detail that lets you do all this stuff. There's, uh, there's part of the logbook. Uh, I, I just ran a plot. There's actually a plot down in there somewhere. Yeah, but I backed off, and, and this is, is the United States that uh, people in the United States, every pen is somebody in the States that's used this thing so far. And it, I, I don't know when I did that, probably a couple of months ago. So uh, this thing works about 20,000 plots a year. And uh, that, that's a lot. But you know what? It doesn't seem to hurt me. Uh, so uh, I don't mind letting it run. And you're welcome to use it. Here's the URL. Uh, HTTPS signal server okfrog.org and uh, you're welcome to to make use of that if you want to and i guess that is um quick that yeah sure yeah just a second I it's in the that. chat for people on the zoom There it is. Yeah, and feel free. And there's lots more to say about it, of course. And, and, and uh, uh, it's sitting here running on this little machine, but we weren't having much luck getting it connected to the internet right here. But uh, it, this is self contained in itself. If you have latitude and longitude of your station and, and uh, height above, uh, ground level for your antenna, I could probably run you a plot right here. Uh, it, the, the, um, what I've encouraged people to, there's at least one Linux distribution that has this at its core. Uh, some fellow back in Kentucky built a Linux distribution and it's available on the web and you can get it. Uh, the whole thing at once and he, he does a lot of SDR stuff for that same Linux distribution. So it's got all sorts of other interesting things on it as well. Uh, err on somebody or another, and I'm uh, yeah. got enough to do on my own plate here, so that, that's what I've done. But uh, at any rate, I'm willing to entertain questions or thoughts or something. Yes, sir. I have two questions. I'm new to all of this. Uh, uh, you mentioned antenna height. My antenna from bottom to top is 15 feet. So, where in that range would I use? <laughs> Gee, I don't know. Pick the center. I mean, it's an approximation. It's not that critical. No, huh? The, the, this stuff, it's good to a few decimal places, but that's all it's good to do. Right. My yeah. second question is, what's the shortest distance you can check? Could you check five miles, ten miles? I noticed the other day some fella running a lot of plots, and I got to look, and he was going from one end of a block to the other at about uh, 25 gig gigahertz and he at that level you see the buildings and you model around the buildings you know so, so uh yeah you know right hmm, thank you hmm. that might have been me <laughs> well it wasn't some guy in california oh, I did, I did 60 gig. 60 60 well yes sir it was up It's an antenna. Now, if you make your own installation of this stuff, the, the website covers up lots of opportunities to input parameters. I mean, it, it, this thing probably got 50 different input parameters on it. And most of them have arranged defaults for us so that we can just click a, a few things and, and build a plot. But if you need more detail than that, this thing can provide it. And so uh, if, if you need to, for instance, have an antenna, uh, you're used to the neck models, NEC models that, that, that show a plot of how an antenna would behave. 
you can impose that plot or, or that set of parameters on an antenna and then put the antenna in this, this, this software and model how that antenna behaves with this software under those parameters for the antenna. So it, it, if you want to get drilled down to that level, you can, but I'd suggest you make your own installation to do it. Now you may be able to get along with just the terrain features that are, are uh, local to you. You know, if you're operating at 60 gigs, uh, great, just download the, the 100 yards each side of you. And <laughs> that's plenty. But, but uh, worldwide, I've got the whole world on this laptop. So I've, got, I've got two, uh, a path that's from, uh, Larry has a twin link uh, set up at his house. And Mark, is it Mark's, uh, what I did here? Uh, that's it. That's it. This is, this is a guy here in town that is getting a good signal yep. between that portion. And you're seeing a little clipping from the terrain on the knife edge portion. Is there any way to tell what actually would work at a given frequency? That, that one, there's a ridge between those two stations, but he can, they can run traffic back without any problems despite that ridge. Is that yeah. Something, I, I, something, I, I, something stick out to you there, why that works? And I'll show you another one that doesn't. No, I, I don't see anything other than it's a fairly small imposition on this thing. I mean, you, you can see at the top there, uh, there's not, it, it's in the clear for the most part. My guess is it's going to work just fine. It does. But, uh, let me see if I can get, get my pointer working here. Oh, the head. There it is right there. This little piece of terrain sticking up isn't very wide, and it's the only one there, and it's probably going to work just fine. One of the things you'll see if you scroll down a little bit on this thing, yeah, is, is what you would have to raise the antenna to to clear that obstruction. And this one would have to, this one is 1151 feet above sea level and the other one is, is something or another. It's down there somewhere. Yeah, and as part of the report down there, it says if you raise the antenna at this end or that end to that high, you clear everything. It, it's in there some, oh, it's generally horrible. Antenna at this end has to be 135 feet up. That might be reasonable. Putting the one at, at the uh, other end at 4,338 feet is, is uh, that's a Parnell zone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you want to. we got another one that's a similar path that we're not getting to work. And, uh... So you're running this on my machine now. I am. Yeah, okay. So it takes a second to make a plot. I mean, that would have been two weeks worth on an apple. <laughs> <laughs> That's a so fairly big machine I've got at the house, by the way. I see, I see that there's probably more trouble here than you're expecting because, uh, ah, pointer gave it, yeah, pointer gave it up. This, uh, this is quite a bit higher. See, that, that's uh, probably 75 feet higher than the path. And here's another one right here. There's a valley in between them. And the fraction of this might work, but it's probably being captured in here somewhere. So it's probably not going to make it. Uh, did did you happen to to uh, do a line of sight plot on, or do the not the line of sight plot, but the uh, profile plot between two stations? Yeah. See. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's try, uh, let's try to get to this. We, maybe we can see where that stopped. 
Oh, I know where it was. Go back to that profile plot. Or just start, just, uh, uh, yeah, do it again. Okay, go ahead and do the plot. Create the plot. And down there somewhere, oh, there it is up top. Download this KML file. And let's stick that KML file into Google Earth if you can. Yeah, you probably will. So it's one thing that when you're talking to somebody, just, I've always pictured the fraction as a horizontal axis ah. where you're going over a ledge. Um, you were talking about the, the, the ticket section. That's a vertical component. That's right. And so if you're going over a, a peak item, you're going to wrap around it in three dimensions. Is that no, it, it's an edge problem. Wherever yeah. there's an edge, you bend around the edge. When you shoot to the edge. <laughs> yeah, you it's, like a, it's like a bull shot. I mean, it's a good. It's a yeah, good that, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Probably on your projects. Yeah. Create. Open. There you go. Import. Computer. All right. Here. There's the spin. Now the green is signal, but here's the hole right here. So if you can oh, zoom in on that. The white? Yep. Oh. 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 Does that tell you anything? It doesn't to me, yeah, but. That's, uh, that's the ridge. That's, that's ridge. a lot of dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> Get the dynamite out. Well, now. Take a repeater. Yeah, I'm having a little trouble seeing that, but it might be that you can move on these stations 200 yards a different direction and miss that whole thing. It's a big long ridge. There are a bunch of repeater towers on that ridge. Ah, so okay. the, the the tower from uh, the tower is planned at uh, the auto patch side would be the up there. So. Yeah. It's all space water. <laughs> <laughs> That's off his computer. It's just a uh, screen Okay. Oh, all right. Now, the, the, the Fresnel zone for 146 for VHF shows down through the earth. Um, does that get involved? I know in UHF or microwave, we see a lot of problems with Fresnel zone interference. But is that low enough to cause a problem? I, I doubt it, to tell the truth. This is what frequency? 146. I doubt that is a problem. But hey, we know. Hey, Mark, roll, roll that down to the data at the bottom of the end. Yes, sir. Thank you, John. What's the my... Yeah, if I would improve my. Uh, KML mapping a little bit, I could probably put all those little humps in there. Those are the obstructions to line of sight. And look like they're all about 13 to 14 miles from one of those stations. That's that ridge. That's that ridge right there. 
where, where it says the antenna would have to be raised to at least 318 feet for all obstructions, is that one inside of the structure? Yeah, yeah. Fresnel zone, it gives a number about Fresnel zone, but it's a horrible number. It's only yeah, thousands of feet. 63.55. Okay, well, uh, you fly your airplane around there. And we'll... <coughs> yeah, we can. But at BHF, that's pretty much the Fresnel zones aren't as uh, pronounced as, as they are. No, and, and they get smaller, it, it can get higher in frequency. Well, don't let anybody bluff you. It's just, not, it's just a model. And it doesn't matter what the antenna is. This is line of size. So back to your question. It doesn't matter what the antenna is, it's just size and size. With the website, that's right. If you make your own installation, you can actually put antenna parameters into it. And for that matter, power, ERP, and things like that, put that in there. And you might burn a hole in that mountain. I know. <laughs> Where's Harold? <laughs> okay. I, I, I'll be happy to hang around a few minutes and take further questions or, or further questions now if you want. I mean, I've got all day. But, but uh, any meeting that goes more than an hour is probably a failure. <laughs> well, thank you for having Okay. Appreciate you. Whoa. Yeah, or here you have the next one, I guess, Peter. Say again?